welcome once again to this week's edition of the official Cyblogs podcast. I'm Elf. I'm Amy. And we are your lovely hosts, uh, bringing you some of the weird and wacky stuff from around the science world from this particular week. Not all of it's wacky, we promise. Some of it's just just educational, but yeah, let's see how we go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, jumping straight in as always. Um, very excitingly, the winners for the 2011 uh, Mix and Mash Data Mashup competition came out today. Um, I know people have been, uh, all the judges have been looking at the results for the last couple of weeks, trying to figure out from uh, the, the huge number of entries, which are the best in each category. Uh, so, well, if you go and have a look at the Mix and Mash website, we'll link to it in uh, this week's blog post, obviously. Um, but the main one is the Supreme Data Mashup. That is the top, top, top prize. And there's some serious money behind it. And this one went to 100 companies by Alex Gibson and Graham Jensen. Awesome. Um, yeah, exactly. Well done, guys. Uh, the mashup lets you interactively say sort of what if to scenarios like doing more tourism or doubling down on agriculture or mining our conservation estate. Basically, what can we do as a country to uh, increase our prosperity? So that's very interesting. But have a look. There are uh, prizes for creative remixes, for data mashups, uh, for literature, for forestry. Well, sorry, forestry was one of the winners in one of the categories. Uh, open government, environment, sport and recreation. There's just a plethora of really fun toys that you can now go and play with to know a little bit more about your country. And that uh, that winning one completely deserved a winner. It's based off um, the data from a Paul Callaghan talk at Strategy New Zealand. It and is. It's very, very, very cool. I was lucky enough to see it before it got released to the general public. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> lucky man. Um, and it was very, very cool. So do, um, do take the time to go and have a look. Yeah, Speaking it is. of prizes... Um, uh, this week, the Ig Nobels for 2011 <laughs> were um, announced. Now, if you don't know what the Ig Nobels are, shame on you. Uh, <laughs> they are the humorous equivalent to the Nobel Prizes, uh, and there have been some hilarious ones in the past. For instance, a New Zealander last year won one for figuring out that if you wore socks on the outside of your shoes, you're less likely to fall over on a slippery hill in Dunedin when it's icy. Um, there's all sorts of cool stuff as well but I just thought we'd mention some of the uh, more interesting ones that have come out uh, come out this year so um, in physiology uh, there's no evidence apparently of contagious yawning in the red -foot red footed tortoise one from chemistry is for making a wasabi scented uh, smoke alarm for <laughs> deaf people one in medicine is for <laughs> Sorry. It's for studying the effects of um, withholding your urine on your ability to concentrate. Awesome. From psychology is uh, people trying to understand why people sigh and having no success at all. Um, literature, a theory of procrastination. <laughs> Biology, uh, why certain kinds of beetles mate with Australian beer bottles, preferentially to the female of their species. Um, and there's actually a really cool post uh, on Sunday, Spineless List, from the Atavism. Yep. Um, that's up this week that sp explains that in a little bit more detail and mentions some of the other posts. <laughs> uh, these these are just brilliant. My personal favourite, though, was um, the Ig Nobel Peace Prize for this year was... <clears throat> from a mayor from a European country, sorry, its name's escaping me at the moment, for driving a tank over illegally parked cars Brilliant. as a way for, um, I guess, stopping people from illegally parking cars. <laughs> it was absolutely marvellous. I remember when it first came out, a lot of people were wondering whether it was a, a hoax of some sort. Uh, yep. It appears not. Uh, to what extent it's staged, well, even if it was staged, it was still a, a brilliant, brilliant uh, action. Uh, it's worth pointing out as well with the Ig Nobles that, that much as they're generally very amusing, um, part of the idea is also that they cause people to laugh and then stop and think. Uh, so they do still have a very sort of strong education on scientific focus. Um, there have been just marvelous, marvelous things over the years. We and do love them. They, yeah, they do that exceedingly well most of the time. They really do. Um, so go and have a look as, as well at those. Have a bit of a giggle. Share them with your mates. Uh, get everyone reading about some science. Um, and, and talking about science, well, as we do on this podcast, and, and uh we will talk a bit about uh, space this week, and uh, Elf will explain to you later why. But this is a great article uh, from the Register, of all things, um, who do quite good sort of science news. This one is about NASA. Um, they are going to be trialing a laser-based space broadband service, which kind of ticks all the boxes for me. 
there's lasers, <laughs> there's space, there's internet, there's satellites, it's, there's NASA, it's just fantastic. The idea is that the current system that they're using to relay images in from the outer solar system particularly is much like dial-up broadband, knocking up against the sort of outer limits of what is useful and feasible. So at the moment, the speeds are about six megabits per second um, divided by eight. It's less than one megabyte per second. And the problem is that means that it takes an hour and a half for a single high-res image to be beamed back to Earth just from Mars. The idea is that this new system uh, can do about 100 megabits per second, which is about 12 and a half megabytes per second. So they're saying about five minutes for that same image as opposed to 90 minutes. This is absolutely fantastic. The idea is that uh, it will be trialed in about 2016, so two to three years to sort of set up um, and, and keep trialing. To, to get it running properly, uh, you can go and have a look and see exactly how they're going to be setting up. There's all kinds of fantastic technology that they'll be using in multiple ground stations and marvelous, marvelous stuff. It's one of three projects that NASA decided to fund earlier in September, um, with the other two being, this is fantastic, an atomic clock in deep space and a solar cell. And solar cells are actually very, very exciting technology Ooh, yes. as well. So go and have a look. It's great fun uh, and, and has some really cool sort of satellite porn equipment with it. Right, and the next article is another space article because it is, in fact, World Space Week this week. That's all I'm going to say for the moment. We'll come back to it later. Uh, but this is an article we picked off, or, uh, picked up on from uh, Sky Mania, and there's a researcher from called uh, David Nesvorny, uh from the Southwest Research Institute in Colorado, and he's come up with this idea that uh, looking at the orbits of all the planets in our solar system, they're actually much more easily understood if you assume that there was a fifth giant planet in our solar system what? early on in its evolution, and it has since disappeared. It's been kicked off into deep space. Wow. And this ties in quite nicely with one of the uh, recent discoveries from NASA that we mentioned a couple of weeks back, that there are um, free-roaming planets out there in the Milky Way. Mm. So there are big Jupiter-sized planets just kind of chilling out, um, flying around, not attached to stars. And this possible... Uh, so he's done a computer simulation uh, that shows that our solar system could could have resulted from the interactions from this fifth planet and it could have feasibly interacted with our sun in such a way that got slingshotted right out of our solar system. Um, and this possibly provides a kind of creation mechanism mechanism for those other wandering planets that are out there. Possibly. It's just a simulation at the moment, but it's still a cool idea. It absolutely is. And, and giant planets bunging their way through space and actually interacting with our solar system, it's nice to know that we aren't left out of all the cosmic awesomeness. And he thinks that if it was in our solar system, it would have been about the size of Uranus, and it would have been out between Saturn and Uranus. Gosh. Okay. Any idea uh, how we might ever be able to uh, say if that's true or not? Well, simply, you have to set up a model solar system and then you inject another planet and see what happens. Okay. All right. So I guess we'll have to see how that comes out. It's certainly a fun hypothesis. And that's sort of fun, that. Mm, exactly. Uh, next one, moving from the very, very big things to the very, very small things. And in fact, small things of small things. Uh, this is looking at the lava of certain beetles. Uh, lava being, of course, slang for baby beetle in this case. What they've found is that uh, the larvas of some beetles are actually able to eat frogs and amphibians, far, far, far bigger than them. And this has been getting scientists quite sort of interested because they couldn't figure out how on earth something small and wiggly like a beetle larva could could attack and, and eat something far larger than it that, that was, in fact, in the case of these frogs, trying to eat the larva itself. They finally figured. <laughs> Elf's looking this at me. This sounds like alien. <laughs> it, it, it kind of is. Elf's looking at me with his terrified face. Um, so they looked at the worm like larvae of the predatory Epomus ground beetle. And what they found was that the beetles wave their antennae and their mouth parts and things and, and basically make all kinds of movement. Uh, and this attracts amphibians. The, the reason being that they sort of hunt off movement. So as they get closer, the, the, the lava wave their bits more and more frantically and, and make more and more sort of visual noise, and the amphibians get drawn in, and then they, they try and attack the larvae, and then the larvae sort of do the whole duck their head sideways and then latch onto the frogs and then suck them dry. It's fantastic. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's really cool. It's like and a beetle version of a kind of... Um 
those mythological things? Seductress? Um, oh, sirens? Possibly? No, not, <laughs> not sirens, but I'll think of it later. He, it, he'll come up with it randomly. <laughs> it's, it's great. And I mean, it's the first time that this, that this has been seen in nature. Certainly there are uh, situations in nature where sort of smaller prey is able to evade predators and sometimes turn the attack back on themselves. But this is the first time that it's been shown that smaller sort of what, what I'm going to call pseudo prey, um, actually predates on the larger things that are trying to eat it. It's, it's just fantastic. There's video of it as well. If you want to go and watch, uh, this happening, those of you who liked alien may enjoy it, but yes, beetles, larvae, great. <laughs> Succubus was the word I was looking for. Oh, right. Yes. <laughs> And I'm not going to segue into this next article with going, talking of succubus, <laughs> despite I'd like to. Uh, this is actually serious for once. Um, mm. uh, one of the big problems in science at the moment worldwide is funding. And there are a lot of complaints. If you know any scientist, you'll probably have had this conversation with them mm. um, at the funding process, who gets funding, who doesn't. And at the moment, a lot of it is focused on academic acumen and essentially how good your H factor or how many um, top journal articles you've yes. had published, yada, yada, yada. So kind of predisposes grants to go to people that have been researching for a long time and that are researching stuff that they know how to research and it doesn't really help new people get into science. So this week in Nature there's been an article published um, by the author is John P. A. Ionidis and essentially he's uh, saying all these different ways we could fund science projects. Now he doesn't come up with a solution, he says this at the end, he's like all of these would be stepping stones to something different and something better but at least they're thinking. So the other possible options that have come up is a a lottery system, so random people, random scientists get large chunks of cash Gosh. um, or all scientists get small amounts of cash which for disciplines like mathematics has a much larger chance of success than for high capital science Science. True. Um, funding according to merit, I've already kind of mentioned. Uh, they've also suggested stating really broad goals rather than refining science down to doing these um, continual reports again and again and again, which saps so much of scientists' time. Hmm. Um, ignoring grant portfolios, they have this wonderful, um, wonderful analogy. They say judging scientists by the size of their portfolio is equivalent to judging art by how much money was spent on paint and brushes rather than the quality of the paintings, ah. <laughs> which is a pretty correct as far as I can tell um, but it does it discusses all these different schemes and their, their benefits and their flaws and it's really interesting to see people thinking about different ways of funding science because the current way um, does waste a lot of time and doesn't necessarily focus the, the money to the best of its use I guess. No certainly the scientists involved don't seem to think that the current system is working um, and, and are increasingly unhappy not only in New Zealand but worldwide and and the problem with being unhappy in a country is one can potentially move to another country but being unhappy worldwide is tricky we've got nowhere else to move 